Yeah, so there's three myota species that would use that exfoliating bark. Little brown bat would use it, but if it's got um, a building structure, they'd much rather go to that. Northern long eared they use it to stay under during the day and also the site where they raise their young. And then the one that we're concerned with here would be the federally endangered Indiana bat. Right. And they use structures similar to what the northern long ear. Now why is the northern long ear doing better than the little the Indiana bat? Probably because the habitat requirements are much more narrow overall for the Indiana bat. The um, northern long ear will move up away from some of our wetlands and stuff like that. Okay. So they're more conducive. Plus, I find the northern long ear, especially during fall migration, will use overhangs like of strip malls and places like that. Oh, really? Whereas the Indiana bat would never, you know, take to a spot like that. So there's a little bit more so toxicity the, 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 to their lifestyle than the other. Tricolored bat, we used to call the pipistro. Yeah. Okay. They will stay under roof overhangs. I will find them in tree roofs, yeah. cavities as well as under the bark. I've also found them in the, the leafy bunches left over by squirrel nests, the drays. Oh, so interesting. They use a lot of different places. You know, I've had a friend of mine had a, a what we call a maternity colony. That's where the females come together to raise their pups right above their front door. You know, so it's kind of <laughs> neat to see. So again, well, that's another species that so. is not so narrowly yeah. defined in its requirements. Great. So, Well, let's go down and take a look at right. your net. So, so a dead tree, bark is peeling. It's a very ephemeral or temporary type of situation, but that's the spot that the sunlight is getting down through the canopy. That's where the babies are going to be warmer. They're going to grow faster because their clock is ticking. They're racing against time. They've got to be born. They've got to be flighted. They have to learn how to hunt. They have to take on enough uh, stored energy to make it from October to April. You know, half a year. So disturbing them in a place like this, if they are babies, could be... Well, it, it won't be allowed if there are. If right. they're Indiana bats, but if, if there are other bats, it's okay. But what happens to those bats? Do they quickly find a new place because they're more when they're less flighted? Picky? They tend to, yeah, they tend to find. And we also find movement between maternity colonies. Some mm -hmm. of the radio tracking I've done has found. Now I've only applied the transmitter to the female, and it's one that's lactating, so she had pups for that mm -hmm. year. I found some individuals later in the season moving between three different hmm. colony sites. So that's um of the little brown bats. Of the little brown bats. <laughs> yeah. And big brown bats are that flexible also? Well, big brown bats will use hollow trees. Uh-huh. But nowadays they use a lot of buildings. Yeah, they use our house. Okay, yeah. So you know, they were able to find a spot yeah. where it's warm, and they're the only species around here that will um, overwinter. Mm -hmm. Now, do you have them in your house? Yeah, yes, have we them do. All winter. Yeah, <laughs> and that we hear them. There's some spot there that they found yep. that doesn't get too warm, <laughs> doesn't get too cold, <laughs> and it's just right. So. At this time, we kind of watch for, and I'll have the bat detector in a few minutes going for activity. Up, up. And I have not seen anything against this lighted sky. Um, so, and then the next thing is structurally looking at what's going to funnel the bats. And so yeah. we've got this overhang. Uh -huh. Whereas, you know, over here, those bats could be foraging way up. Right. They're having to drop down to travel through this corridor. Well, hopefully into the nets. That's the idea. So, uh -huh. <coughs> this one is on that upper end of that. Let me get this down. All right, that's set. Merrill setting the mist net.
comes in through the top, so you can kind of direct it. You can just set it oh, down okay. your choice. Okay. And that just kind of acoustically monitoring what's going on here. And um, okay, I see them flying past this net. Two of them. Okay. They're zipping in that, that window of light out that way. I don't see them right now. But one thing is where the bats roost and where they feed aren't always the same place. Right. Um, a lot of the uh, females that I've tracked to find their maternity colonies that they're coming at, they'll, they'll be miles away. To, in that effort to try to maintain diversity, be able to, you know, you wonder why so much energy into one species of bat, but we don't know enough to say that, you know, if the maternity colony's here, then it's X far, there went across there. And that, that was big enough to be a big brown bat. Uh -huh. I was catching. The other ones were smaller. There he swoops again. But we're not picking that one up here. Oh, got one little click, maybe. Yeah, I can see them. Either one or two. Yeah, I've been seeing two at some points. Okay, I tried changing the frequency, but it's not coming in. So the one we were hearing was much closer to us. The high frequency sounds don't carry very far. Right. So they put a lot of energy into it. You would think, well, why not? do low frequency sounds like our marine mammals do that would travel great distances but but if they're if they're navigating you know the high frequencies get blocked so that must give them more information well low, low uh, some of it seems to be around. tied into prey size oh that's true with the, yeah. yeah so they're matching the wavelength peak from one to the other to the prey size smaller bats eat smaller bugs higher frequencies yeah. Lower water. That was I that just one. Right just some, yeah. <clears throat> so, you know, we've got activity up there, and it's, you know, we can't get nets up there. Right. Yeah. We're limited in our sampling technique. Yeah. So we do what we can do, but we're definitely never guaranteed of. Now, with some of the new uh, detectors that we're able to record and then try to match on a computer uh, program that call to specific species. And the oh. Indiana bat, what does it have for a... It's fairly high, but it's very similar to the little browns and the northern long ears in their calls. But it takes some training. And the, you know, if we look at a recording of an Indiana bat from, let's say, over in um, New York State, and compare the calls here to Toledo area, they wouldn't be the same. There, really? There's those regional dialects. Right. That won't <laughs> so they just kind of, ours has more of a drawl than what they do. <laughs> <laughs> right. So it's because. They're taking advantage of the heat source mm -hmm. on the inside. But if it's too warm where they're at, they're going to use energy too quickly. And, um, oh, I know what it is. It's mulberries dropping on Oh, me. Dry. I saw that. I'm, too. <laughs> I'm thinking there's not mud up there. The bird's not doing it to me. Yeah, What's you get a snack. <laughs> Nothing like waiters full of mulberry. <laughs> oh, and there's one of your ducks. Oh, already? Oh. Okay, so, one's in the net or did it bounce off? Uh, I think it made it through the first time and then went back to go into the net. So it's in. Ducks. Alright. Has anybody got a good recipe? No. Duck, yeah. <laughs> The whole mulberry duck does sound good. <laughs>